Hello, welcome to the program, and I'm pleased to say joining us at Kiev Media Week is Neil Landau. He's a scriptwriter, producer, and professor, and best-selling author. Hello, thank you very much for joining us. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, so, um, firstly, before we ask you about uh, television and uh, the state of it, uh, the medium at the moment, uh, can you tell us a bit about your career and also um, how you are now um, sort of expanding and working in LA as a professor? Um, I would say that everything I've done in my life has been completely um, not based on any long-term strategy. Uh, <laughs> I, I believe in synchronicity, and so I've, I've always wanted to be a writer. So even from the time I was, I think I was 10 years old, I wrote my first play. Uh, I was always wanting to escape into fantasy worlds. Um, for a tragic reason that ultimately I'm okay now, but um, when I was six years old, my father suddenly died of a heart attack. He was 39 years old, and he was playing basketball, and he collapsed, and he never, he never woke up. Uh, so early childhood trauma, um, learning about abandon, you know, feeling abandoned because intellectually, I all I knew is he disappeared. Um, I started to be very fascinated by magic, magical realism, fantasy worlds, because of course my greatest dream was that my father would somehow magically return. Yeah. Um, now I am a father, I have two sons, so it's kind of been a healing process. But, um, so I started off wanting, writing plays, writing little skits. Um, I, I liked humor because I had a lot of sadness early in life, and so I was kind of, I was very small. I was the, the shortest and skinniest kid in school <laughs> until I was in a senior in high school and I finally grew. Uh, but I was the class clown. I learned I could get uh, become popular by being funny and, or at least trying to be funny. Um, and then I started to write longer plays. And then because I was raised by a single mother who didn't have a formal education, my mother didn't go to university. She just had to work. I have an older brother, and we were, we were poor. We lived, my father didn't have life insurance. We, had, we lived in a motel, uh, and I saw how hard it was for my mother to support us. So I knew going into the theater is a very difficult way to make money as a writer, um, except for you know select few. Yeah. So the idea of writing for television and movies was a practical decision. I thought, well, I could write and actually, if I'm fortunate enough and if I have talent, maybe I can make a, make a living doing this. Because I knew I, I didn't really have other, anything, other talents really. I, I wasn't a good athlete. <laughs> I, I'm a, I can't stand the sight of blood. I knew I couldn't be a doctor. You know, I'm, I'm, I, I'm not technical, technologically savvy. So, but I knew. But people told me early on. Early teachers, early mentors told me that I could write, and so I, I just started to write and tell stories, and um, that eventually brought me to uh, making short films. And then I, you know, applied to UCLA School of Theater, Film, and Television mm. to the screenwriting program, and I got accepted. And um, but you've had some amazing. I mean, I was actually looking through your CV before you came for the interview, and we could probably spend a whole interview uh, just talking about your CV as such. But um, a Magnificent Seven, which was on yeah. CBS. Yes, um, Melrose Place, yeah. Doogie MTV. MD, yeah. So MTV you had all these successes, and, and they all came from the fact that you love telling stories. Yes, but also the other, the other part of it is because my mother worked all, all the time to, to, you know, to put food on the table and pay the rent, um, I, I often say I was raised by television. That was my babysitter. Do you, do you remember when you were younger, just spending hours in front of the Hours, your yeah. hours. Day, uh, during the day, at night, it was like my constant companion. Because my brother was an athlete, and he was always busy playing sports. I, I always say I was like an indoor kid. And then I, just, when I, I remember going to see Raiders of the Lost Ark. That was the first m movie where I just... You just blown I couldn't away. believe I was blown away. I couldn't believe, and one of my best friends was an usher at the movie theater, so I could go for free. And I went, every, I rode my bike, and I went to see Raiders of the Lost Ark every single day for like wow. two months. Uh -huh. And um, but uh, I had a writing partner early on in my career. Um, we grew up together. We knew each other since we were 
12 years old. And she is now a novelist. Her name's Tara Eisen. And we both love to write. And she was also an actress. So she would perform in some of my plays. And then we decided to try to write together because we thought maybe we would write for a sitcom. And it's easier to break into the business of half hour comedy if you have a writing partnership, especially if you're a male female partnership. And we were very, very young. We were in our early 20s. So we thought we would get a job writing for a sitcom. But at the same time, we started to write some movie scripts. And the first one we wrote was terrible, and we just put it away. It was our training wheels. The second one got us some attention, helped us get an agent. Um, I had done an internship at a, company, a really great television company, legendary TV production company called MTM Enterprises, which was Mary Tyler Moore and Grant Tinker's company. I did my internship there, and one of the executives, she was the vice president of comedy development, she left to become a, a literary agent. So she became my first agent. Yeah. And that second script, we had a lot of meetings and attention, but nothing happened. The third script we wrote, we, there was a bidding war at three major studios. And I had been working at a travel agency, mm -hmm. making $18,000 a year. And that script sold for over $500,000. So you were pleased then? <laughs> I was pleased. It was my, it was my big break. Um, that movie became Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's Dead with Christina Applegate. Mm. That movie, which I know is not a great movie by any means, uh, over the decades has become more and more popular and in the States it's now like a cult movie. I don't understand why exactly, but... Um, That's probably because you're involved. You're, you're too close to it. You, you can't maybe. quite see it. It's, yeah. it's not a very good movie, but people quote lines of dialogue from it to me to this day, when people find out I wrote that movie to this day, they, they, they just think that I'm like some big, you know, some big deal. Do you deal. find that people actually recite the lines to you? All yes, the time? they do. <laughs> yes, they do. In airports, on planes, it's, 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 it's um, both mystifying and pleasing at the same time. Yep. Um, and that got us into television because ironically that script um, made it into the hands of Stephen Bochco, who, who passed away recently, mm -hmm. who was running a show called Doogie Howser, MD. And because we were very young, and that was a show with Neil, pa Neil Patrick Harris, as he was a, a teenage doctor, that was the theme. Uh, that, that's how we got our first job in television. And what's doubly ironic is when I did my internship at MTM, the show I interned on was Hill Street Blues, mm -hmm. which was produced and created by Stephen Bochco. Oh. So uh, that was also a synchronicity or cosmic choreography, whatever you want to call it. But just about everything I've ever done has been sort of a happy accident or uh, I've followed my passion or curiosity and it led to something else. But it was never like super strategic. But this is only one part of your career really because yes. if you fast forward to um, well, modern times, you could yes. say this, this decade, yes, yes. you've had a number of best-selling books, you had uh, TV out of the box, Yes. Um, and I was reading the reviews, everyone's uh, praising the book, and for those of you, people who are watching who perhaps haven't seen it, can you sum it up? I know it's 350 pages long, but is it, if it's possible to sum it up? Well, I saw that the television business, which of course I was obsessed with since a child, being a young kid, I saw a very big change happening, very much like what happened in the music business with you know Napster and then iTunes. And, and I saw that I could kind of see that we're on demand and streaming that we were headed in that direction. And so I decided um, nobody's writing about this. Nobody seems to be that interested and nobody really understands where it's going. I think anytime there's a big shift in technology and in, in any form of technology, there's a lot of resistance to change. Um, the digital television revolution is is completely based on disruption of traditional business models. So what I did was I actually thought, I'm just gonna go out into the field and learn what's going on and what's happening. So I had kind of a Zen approach, which is I started with an empty rice bowl. <laughs> and I went out and, to do interviews and talk to people. I talked to Ted Sarandos, who's the chief of content at Netflix. I talked to Genji Cohen, who did Orange is the New Black, which was one of the first shows on Netflix. I talked to Bo Willeman, who was the adapter of House of Cards, you know, the US version. And I ended up doing over 80 interviews. 
and each one I would learn something and learn something. And, and I started, I say to people, um, I'm a writer, I'm an author, I'm a script writer, I'm a producer, I'm a professor, but really I'm in the pattern recognition business. And I started to notice certain themes and patterns. And so TV Outside the Box was kind of um, trying to see and predict where everything was going. And the big takeaway for me was that once you watch TV on demand without commercials, you don't want to go back to watching old traditional television with yeah. commercial breaks because those are very artificial and they create what's called schmuck bait, where <laughs> that's the TV expression where you have to write to the act break and there has to be a cliffhanger every 15 minutes for the commercial. Yeah. And that creates very formulaic, kind of forced, inorganic storytelling. Whereas on demand, it's slow burn, it can unfold at a different pace. So that was one trend. The other was just the number of shows creates great variety. So it used to be if you had an idea for a series and you went out to pitch it or sell it, mm -hmm. they would pass and reject it because they'd say it's too niche. Okay. Now niche is the new mainstream. Everybody wants niche content. Um, so you don't need to have one show that everyone's going to watch, like the Super Bowl or the Oscars or something. You can have many different shows that will be the favorite show of many different people. So fragmented viewership. Mm -hmm. I could also see that that was sort of the death knell for the traditional broadcast network. Because actually this is how a lot of on uh, online streaming services work. Because um, they say, you, because you watch one program, oh, we'll recommend this yes. or recommend that. Yes. It's, it's tailored. It's almost like a, you know, when you go on YouTube and you, you have your recent search history and have other related videos. So this is yes. how it's becoming more and more. It's all based on algorithms and it's based on data acquisition about their customers. So I always say, well, one big, you know, the two biggest streaming networks are Amazon and Netflix, but they're very different. Amazon is a retail company. Netflix is a media company, but they're both, they both know everything about all of us. Yeah. They know what you had for breakfast, they know where you went on vacation, they know, and yes, if you, bought, if you like this show, let's, we'll recommend these five other shows. And, you know, it, it's just this self-fulfilling prophecy in a way that yeah. it will just continue to build and expand. I think it's interesting um, we talk about the TV business as such because is there a TV business anymore or is TV just the medium that we receive content through? Yeah, it, a lot of it is segmented by age. It's age and socioeconomics. So most people, I don't know many people over the age of, uh, well, I should say, I don't know anybody under the age <laughs> of 50 who watches television on a television. Mm -hmm. They watch on their laptops, on their iPads. My kids watch on their phones. Even though we have a big screen TV, they, they like having control and watching on their own. Most viewers now are what we call agnostic viewers. They don't care what the network or platform is. They just want to watch the show. Mm -hmm. And you just type it in to, and it tells you. And many times you have options. It'll say you can watch it on Netflix, or you could download it on iTunes and buy the season, or you know, um, Hulu is, a sec is a, what's called the second window. It's where you can catch shows you missed on broadcast network television. So when I grew up, television was called, it was called linear television. It was programmed in time slots and it had commercials. And if you missed an episode, you had to wait until the summer for the reruns. Well, that doesn't happen anymore. Now you can watch shows anytime you want. You can watch as many episodes as you want. Um, and you're never going to miss an episode. So is that just a question of distribution, of giving um, access to the shows on a, across multiple platforms or does it also affect the content as well because I would imagine that a lot of filmmakers now would slowly be moving over to these serials because they're very popular you know at the, yes. sort of the more niche mm -hmm. market and it, actually if you look on these online streaming sites uh, some of the features some of the documentaries uh, the dramas are really good yeah I mean for me as I've gotten older but even just for younger people, the best storytelling right now is happening on television. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it is because it's more of a long-term relationship. So if you love some, you know, it, it, but it really depends on the story itself. 
I was watching a movie called uh, Quiet Place on the Plane. Oh yes, I've seen this. Which yes, which yeah. I really enjoyed. That, that that that's a movie that's designed to be a finite, very suspenseful, you know, hundred minute movie. Um, but a movie like Argo, for example, that could have easily been a series. There were I wanted much more. When the movie was over, I thought that's it, <laughs> you know. Or the movie Spotlight. When that ended, I wanted to I wanted to continue watching. So the connection you, you make with characters is one of the big distinctions between cinema and television. Um, Sarah Wickler, who uh, works for Studio Canal, she, she said something, I met her when I, I was at the Cannes Film Festival in the spring, because I still love movies, mm -hmm. um, even though I love television a little bit more. Uh, but she said, movies are a communal experience. They're designed to watch in a big room in the dark with a whole community of people. Television series are more like a second life, where you tap into somebody else's life, where you become a part of their family vicariously, and that's a long-term relationship. And the level of empathy and the fluidity of our relationships with these characters is very much mirrors our lives and our families. And so we have second lives, third lives, fourth lives, yeah. and you really feel like their problems are your problems. And I think that's a big distinction. Um, but yes, we're seeing A-list directors, Martin Scorsese doing Boardwalk Empire, David Fincher doing House of Cards and Mindhunter, Ava DuVernay doing Queen Sugar. I mean, everybody's coming to television now because you can tell, I think, a story that has much more depth and you can explore things over time, which is, for me, a much more satisfying experience. And perhaps you also, nowadays, don't have to worry so much about um, satisfying all the audience that might be watching at that particular time, which I, I mean, probably in the past was a demand of TV executives. If yes. you have a prime time slot on a television channel, yes. then you have to get maximum audience across every demographic. Yes, very astute uh, observation. So the overnight TV rating is now completely irrelevant. Nobody cares about it anymore. Nobody. Um, if you don't see the, the pilot, it doesn't mean the show's not going to be a success. It just means people didn't watch it in the time slot. Mm -hmm. They'll watch it maybe two, three, four days later. Maybe they'll watch it, you know, a year later. Breaking Bad, which premiered on AMC, was not very successful. I mean, it, it was critically successful, but not very many people watched it. But when it migrated over to Netflix, it became huge yeah. and a phenomenon. I think I remember actually only watching that series about a year or two later after it came out because there was more hype yes. after that rather yes. than when it was. It's a bit like the, uh, the cult film that you were talking yes. about. <laughs> yes, and most, uh, many people believe that Breaking Bad is a Netflix original series, but it's not. It's, yeah. It was an AMC series. Do, do you see that more producers, filmmakers are struggling to get into the industry because of this move from television into online? Or do you think it actually opens the door to more opportunity? Oh, it's opened up the door to just practically an infinite number of opportunities. Um, there will be over 500 scripted shows this year across multiple platforms. That's unprecedented. Uh, so the only negative to that is the uh, salaries are lower mm. in so-called new media. I say we live in a time now where things are, there's no going back, only forward faster mm. in media. And terms like new media are actually old terms now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, because actually you're writing about this. You have a new book which you published a couple of months ago. Yes. Uh, can you tell us a bit about that, the name and, and, sure. and yeah, more about the content? Um, well, after I finished TV Outside the Box, um, because it's all moving so fast, you know, time just in general is moving much faster than it used to, right? <laughs> we're, we're connected all the time. There, there's so many interesting, I'm so fascinated by this subject just because we've never had the ability to be connected 24 seven more than we are now through all of our devices. And yet we've never been more disconnected as mm. humanity, no, that's true. Yeah, absolutely. right? Yeah. And so there's this void, and I think a lot of the TV content and the second lives are filling that void, which I think is why there are so many shows. I actually think it's fulfilling a need, and a need for catharsis and empathy and, and all of that. But when I finished TV Outside the Box, um, 
while I was in the process of doing that book, because half the book are interviews and the other half of the book are my insights and you know observations and uh, pattern recognition and you know while that book was in process to becoming published there was just this whole new crop of amazing new shows and I thought I wish I could write about those now because now <laughs> I'm you know and I also noticed that it's not just that the shows are being distributed differently and consume differently, but they're actually being made differently. Um, because, you know, Law and Order, for example, that used to be a case of the week, you know, where it was a one hour drama where you had a murder, an investigation, a trial, and a verdict. And it wasn't in one hour, it was in 41 minutes with commercials. Oh, because you had the commercials. Yeah. And then next week you'd have a whole, you know, formulaic, completely inauthentic, because as we all know, most cases never even go to trial. Mm -hmm. Um, now we have the season-long procedural, where there'll be maybe one murder investigation, like Broadchurch, or you know, over the course of the whole. So a season. bit more suspense. No. Yes, and a deeper dive. I mean, Big Little Lies, Goliath, um, The Night of, you know, um, the, these are the kinds of. So the slow burn procedural is one of is one of the you know ways that shows are being created differently. Um, you don't need to come up with a new murder and a new suspect every, every week. You can go deeper into the case. And the broadcast networks have also gotten into this game with um, you know, American Crime on ABC. Ryan Murphy has you know, uh, American Crime Story. Last night at the Emmys, um, the assassination of Johnny Versace won multiple awards, deservedly. It, it's, it, it's a brilliant. Uh, uh, series and Ryan Murphy really invented the serialized anthology series, which is a whole new genre and format. And um, we're going to see more of those as well. We had the People versus O.J. Simpson and Johnny Versace, and you know. So I just think it's exciting because it's not just about following formula and everything has to fit into exactly 41 or 42 minutes with commercials. Mm. Shows are different lengths now. Some of them are sh a little bit shorter. Some are a little bit longer. Um, so it's a flexibility, almost, that they didn't really have before. Correct. Yeah. Flexibility of time slots, tone has much more fluidity now. It used to be, well, is it a comedy or is it a drama? You know, now you can say, well, it's a little bit of both. <laughs> and that's not a negative anymore. Yeah. So another you know, pattern I noticed is blurring the lines between genre and tone, which is now welcome because it's more authentic. And, it's what, and I think that's also very exciting and liberating for people who write for television, not to be sort of just pigeonholed and stuck, yeah. stuck in a box. Well, since you write uh, these books, I mean, your last book came out in 2014, I believe it was. No, TV. This, well, the new one is called, and, you are, and I should have said, I'm bad at marketing myself. <laughs> so the new book is called TV Writing, Writing On Demand. Mm. And the subheading is creating great content in the digital era. Yeah, so that's one that came out a couple of months ago and then you had your book before, but are you in the business of predicting the future? Like, can you? <laughs> My crystal ball. Yeah, if you had a crystal ball, how would you predict uh, for your next book? You could start planning now. Um, yeah. What trends do you think we're gonna see? And, you know, perhaps even we would have VR technology, which comes into these. Yeah. Do you think that's a, a possibility or? I do. Yeah? I do, in fact, um, somebody was talking to me about how they'll start to be um, VR zoos uh, <laughs> instead of, you know, um, there, there are now VR experiences where, because, you know, again, you go back to socioeconomics and, you know, we're, we, we're living in a world that's never been more polarized, right? And so, um, and so much of that is wealth disparity. So you have the 1% and then you have people who are very poor and just starving and suffering and it's so part of what I'm, I'm when I'm, in, I'm doing a, a big seminar on Saturday I but the new pattern and it's sort of probably what I'll write about next is this idea that we live in a daily basis with cognitive dissonance where two things that are completely different from one another coexist mm -hmm. and how do we make sense of this in this world and um, VR is just an example of bridging the gap between socioeconomics because, 
if you don't have the advantages to travel all over the world and see the Taj Mahal or go to the Louvre or yeah. have all these other experiences, VR can transport you there yeah. and you can have a simulated experience. So I think there's, it, it could give people opportunities for education and cultural enrichment and hopefully empathy because the more you travel and the more you get to see other people's lives and how they live, you realize that the things that are similar about us as people are much more uh, we have much more in common than we have differences. And uh, I believe, and it sounds very idealistic, and, and I am an optimist uh, by nature, even with you know, a child who lost his father at a young age, I've always remained hopeful and optimistic somehow. I, I'm a survivor. I learned that from my mother, and I truly believe in the power of story to change the world yeah. for, for the better. Oh, that's fascinating. Thank you so much. And I think uh, one final thing before we leave is, the only thing with VR is the scary films, because I don't think I would quite have the nerve to watch a scary film using VR. I've seen these videos on YouTube of people falling over and that sort of thing. VR has a limitation because so far you can only tell very short stories. Mm -hmm. I did one where I walked between the former Twin Towers in New York on a, on a wire with VR. Wow. And it is terrifying. But that, that'll but be another adjustment that happens with, with technology. And then augment, augmented reality, AR is another place where I think we're going. Um, because the audience wants to participate um, and wants to have different experiences. That's part of being a human being. We're curious. So I say to people, stay tuned. That's perfect. That's a great time to end the, uh, the interview yeah. on. Thank you so much, Neil. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you. That was Neil um, Landau, a scriptwriter, producer, professor, and best-selling author. You're watching Viewing TV. <laughs>